so welcome everybody. Uh, my name, uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm David Wilkins. I'm the director, the faculty director of the program on the legal profession, and this is a speaker series, which we do most Tuesdays and sometimes other days of the week as well, where we uh, have the great honor of bringing some of the most interesting practitioners and academics studying the profession uh, here to Harvard Law School to engage with students and faculty, both from the law school and around the university. Uh, before I introduce uh, today's speaker, I just want to say a, a word about a, another event we're having tomorrow, which we would love to have all of you attend. Uh, as some of you may know, the annual meeting of the International Bar Association is uh, taking place here in Boston this week. And actually, as Kevin and I were just speaking, it's the largest association of lawyers in the world, actually. There's something like 6,000 lawyers who are here in Boston. And uh, well, uh, approximately 500 of them are going to be here at Harvard Law School for a panel that we're doing called uh, Preparing for the Future, the Changing Structure, Technology, and Regulation of Legal Practice. Uh, in which we're going to talk about really the kinds of issues that are going to shape the lives and the practicing lives of all the students in the room. It's uh, up in the big uh, convention space, as I call it, in Wasserstein uh, from 2.30 to 5.30. You could come in and out if you have classes or other obligations. Uh, but there's going to be a, a terrific uh, array of speakers, you know, led off by me, but it gets better than that. Uh, we have the uh, head of the European Bar Association, the former Solicitor General of India, and a dear friend of Pravind <coughs> Gopal Subramanian, and uh, probably the world's foremost expert on the regulation and the changing global regulation of the legal profession, a woman named Laurel Terry, who's a professor uh, at Penn State Dickinson. Um, and there'll be also lots of time for question and answer. And then there'll be a very nice reception, nicer actually than we at Harvard Law School could put on, because it's co-sponsored by the Australian Bar Association, and they're bringing Australian wine. <laughs> but don't just come for the reception. Come for the academic knowledge first, and then you can have the, there'll be food and wine, and it should be a fascinating experience. Please come, come and sit down. Um, so. Uh, one more thing about that event is that we're looking for student volunteers, particularly who might be able to help us at the beginning, so say between 2 and 2.30, to guide the people. People are going to be coming from the main convention site, which is in downtown Boston, by buses. They're actually busing them over here to see us. And we just want to make sure that they get up and in the uh, event uh, safely and soundly. Uh, and in return, what we will do is try to introduce you to as many of these interesting lawyers as possible. There's a kind of pre-reception for the speakers, which of course you'll be invited to. And if you can stay to the event, and particularly after the event during the reception, we'll make a point of sort of calling attention to all our student volunteers. And it's a great opportunity to meet uh, some of the amazing lawyers who have gathered here from around the world. So that's my plug. That's Hakim Lakhtar. He's the uh, administrative director of the program on the legal profession. If you're interested, did see him after the event. But uh, before we get to tomorrow, we have an absolutely terrific uh, speaker today. It really is a great honor uh, for me to introduce Pravin Parekh, who is one of India's most distinguished uh, advocates in the Supreme Court, and also one of its foremost public interest lawyers, who has had a very long and distinguished career in a whole range of important matters. I told him I wasn't going to introduce him to the full extent he deserves, because otherwise there'd be no time for him to speak and no time for you to ask questions. So with that as a tease, I turn the microphone yeah. over to Pravin. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, my dear family members of Harvard family. And I'm, I, I, I written down my speech, but I propose to talk to you and not read my speech at all. I'm very glad that uh, Mr. D.M. Popert, uh, the leading solicitor in India, in Bombay, Mulla and Mulla, and Mr. Malhotra, uh, both of them leading lawyers in India who have come for IBA conference, and they are here with us. Well, it's a great privilege for me to be here. I was once upon a time in 1986 here, and a person sitting next to me as a student was the Chief Justice of Supreme Court of Massachusetts. And he didn't tell me for first two days. When I asked him, what he said, well, I happened to be so-and-so, you know. <laughs> well, uh, the 
public interest litigation is, uh, is, is not started in India, but what is done by Indian Supreme Court is something absolutely uh, unbelievable. And when I talk to a large number of judges and lawyers from the other jurisdictions, they are surprised or sometimes pleasantly shocked or unpleasantly, but they do not believe it. In fact, that how, how does this operate in your Supreme Court? Of course, our constitution has picked up good things from various other constitutions, uh, separation of power from US they picked up and uh, the, the uh, directive principles were picked up from Irish constitution and so on and so forth. But we have got a chapter on fundamental rights which assures basic rights whether it is equality, whether the freedom of speech and expression and uh, a large number of rights are reserved. And to enforce those rights, you can directly go to the Supreme Court of India. There is Article 32, which itself is a fundamental right. And of course, the same jurisdiction, wider in a sense, is with the high courts. And you have a choice to go to high courts or Supreme Courts. But when it comes to public interest litigation, Supreme Court never says you first go to high court and then come to us. They themselves do it. Now, how does the, 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 uh, uh, the public interest litigation, in fact, what happens normal courts all laws require that if you go to a court of law to enforce your rights, you will have to say what is your locus tendi. Why are you? How are you affected? Are you going to gain if I give a judgment to you or not? If you do not have any right or you are not enforcing your personal right, then you have no business to come to court and do not waste our time, etc. Is the normal rule about anyone who wants to go to court has to establish that he has a cause of action, is a right to approach the court. But there are people who cannot go to court either because they do not have the resources or because they are ignorant or because they are suppressed socially, economically, politically. So, they cannot even think, forget uh, the huge fees which uh, good lawyers charge and uh, therefore, there are class of people who are unable to approach the court. Now, can someone else go to court and say, I, I am not claiming anything for myself, but I am claiming something for the, the children who are working in the fireworks factories, you, you are most of them minors, children working on the carpet industries, children are suffering, women are suffering, there are environmental problems which does not affect ABC, but it affects the, the, the entire uh, group of people living in a particular area. Now, this type of cases. I cannot say that I have any cause of action personally. I am not that <laughs> child. Uh, uh, there is trafficking going on, the women, children and uh, a large number of downtrodden out of poverty, they are, they, they are forced into it and once they get into it, they become slaves of the, the traffickers and they cannot come out. Now, can they come to court and say, please give me relief? No, they cannot. And that is why this locus standi uh, <coughs> principle was developed in India. And if you are, normal rule is that if you are a busy body, you just want to come and harass the court or harass your, somebody else who is your enemy or is your competitor, then you will not be allowed to come with a public interest litigation. But if you have a bona fide case in which you are not personally interested, but you want this to be enforced and the court to take cognizance, then the court will permit you to, uh, to, to, to uh, file the petition. Now, it is possible for someone who wants to enforce fundamental rights of somebody else or of a group of people or of a large number of uh, categories of persons and he wants to come to the court, the court will inquire that am I doing it with some malice, am I doing it with some, uh, some something for instance, if, if there is a big hotel in an area and another hotel is coming up and if I want to stop the construction of that hotel on X, Y, Z grounds. Am I financed by the other chap, other hotel to say that please delay it so that my hotel can run? Now, it happens. Therefore, the court will find out am I a bona fide person to espouse this public interest causes. There are some people whose bona fides are well known, there are some lawyers, there are some non lawyers who go to courts and courts know that here is a person. When he comes to the court, you can assume that he is not doing anything for any ulterior purposes. Now, Supreme Court has expanded its own jurisdiction. Really, if today you were to uh, wake, uh, wake up our founding fathers who framed our constitution uh, with the chairman was Dr. Ambedkar and if you wake them up from their graves and ask them, 
did you mean this when you gave powers to Supreme Court? Did you mean that this is what they had access in and they will all be shocked they said we never meant. But by and large people are happy that the Supreme Court is exercising the public interest uh, jurisdiction in a way and uh, they, they uh, in fact it is normally said that the sky is the limit for uh, jurisdiction of Supreme Court, but I think even sky is not the limit, they can, they can go beyond sky and do anything which they think is good, good for public interest litigation. Now, uh, of course, as I said, the Supreme Court has, has a discretion to say, no, we do not agree with you, we, you have not come to us uh, bona fide. Therefore, as I said, if there is someone is too poor, a class of people are too poor, too ignorant or too much suppressed by certain uh, group of people, now th then what do you do? Uh, therefore, somebody will come and approach the Supreme Court. Therefore, this technicalities, now there are some lawyers who can come to court, there are some non-lawyers who can come to courts. And what is very important is that if the judges of Supreme Court and it applies to certain extent to high courts, but uh, in our jurisdiction, Supreme Court is the highest court unlike US constitution where only certain matters can go to the Supreme Court of USA. In our jurisdiction against every high court judgment, you have a right to go to Supreme Court. Of course, the Supreme Court on Mondays and Fridays decides whether your matters is worth admitting. If it is worth admitting, they admit, otherwise they dismiss. But you have a right, each one has a right to go against each and every judgment of high courts, be it civil, criminal, labor, taxation, any branch of law. You have a right to approach the Supreme Court and Supreme Court will not dismiss as US Supreme Court does, uh, it's sitting in the chamber. They will hear you before dismissing, hear you for 5 minutes, 10 minutes, they read the papers in advance and say, yes, I, uh, I will give you leave to appeal and then you are heard full phrase. Otherwise, it will be dismissed at the admission stage. Now, so as I told you, the rule of locus standi is waived or they are not bothered. But sometimes the Supreme Court judges read something in a newspaper or see something on a television and say, so, oh, this is very unfair, very unjust to that category. Then they do not wait for a public interest litigant to come to the court. The court suo moto on its own motion will order the registrar, please number this as a writ petition and issue notice. Issue notice to whom the court will decide because there is no petitioner, there is no respondent. But the persons who are affected, persons who are doing what the court considers to be corrected by them in public interest jurisdiction, we say we will give the notice if it is a central government who is in charge because we have a division of uh, just you have in US also. In US, the initially your division was really uh, even today is more in favor of uh, uh, states rather than the central, but with the interpretation of commerce cause, etc., that jurisdiction is increased and it has to increase really. In sup our co jurisdiction, constitution has given more rights to central than to the state. So, they will call the central government, state government or any authorities who are in charge. There is a pollution control board in uh, different states. They may call them and say that what is happening. Now, I will give you one personal example. There is a river called Gomti river. In fact, in India, most of the rivers are worshipped as, as god or goddess, they are worshipped. And uh, uh, Ganga river is one of the very, very, um, I mean, uh, it, uh, people really have a lot of respect as, as, a, as a goddess. And it is said that when you die, if you put few drops in the, in the dead body's mouth, few drops of that river, the person will go to heaven. Of course, we do not know whether the heaven or hell exists, but that is that type of <laughs> that type of respect is given uh, to our rivers. Now, one Mr. Vinit Kumar Mathur writes a postcard, poor chap, I did not want to spend more money than uh, or does, did not have, to Supreme Court saying this Gomti river is being polluted and is the water is not drinkable, you cannot even uh, use that water for any good purpose, but people are helpless, there is no other water, so they use this. So, Justice Rangnath Misra was that those days uh, uh, Chief Justice of India and uh, he received this postcard in the open court, 10.30 we start in Supreme Court. He said, I have received a postcard and I want to consider this as a writ petition. So, the order the court master called Mr. Praveen Parekh, I want to appoint him as amicus curiae. So, a postcard has nothing, it says Gomti river is being polluted, it passes through large number of districts in U United uh, uh, U U UP, uh, one of the largest uh, state uh, in, uh, in India. So, the postcard only said this, so the, the, the justice, the chief justice Mistra, he called me, 
in the court and uh, we always, uh, everyone knows who is where, those who are regular practitioners in Supreme Court, they can find out where I will be located. So I was located, I went there, he said, Mr. Uh, Mr. Parekh, I appoint to you as MI Cascure, that is friend of the court. Here is a postcard. So, to take <laughs> so have a look at the postcard. So I read, I say, yes. So now I want you to file a regular writ petition, but in the writ petition, I am supposed to investigate and find out what to write. Therefore, I, I, I got in touch with that man, I got in touch with some other people around and found out basic points and I filed a writ petition. To this writ petition, the normal procedural laws do not apply. I do not have to swear an affidavit. Normally, if you go to court, you have to swear that what you say in your petition is true, but I cannot swear because I do not know anything except that whatever, <laughs> whatever I have ascertained from people. Then, uh, you do not have to pay any court fees because it is a PIL initiated by Supreme Court itself. And you can not have any knowledge, personal knowledge or even knowledge based on information. So, and whom to join as respondents, that again I had to draft, so I decide. I decided I will call Union of India and the state of Uttar Pradesh, that is the province in which the, this river is. And uh, there is a Central Pollution Control Board which is supposed to look after the entire country and UP State Pollution Control Board, which is supposed to look after that province. I joined them and I requested the court that, well, uh, I do not have uh, 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 information at all and you will issue notice to these people, so they will come. So they all came. The central government says, this is not our problem. We, we are not supposed to look after what happens in the state river. And uh, state government says, I cannot look after because I do not have money and central government under a certain scheme is supposed to give me money, but they are not giving me money, so I cannot look after the river. The pollution control board, in fact, uh, the, I, I could feel that there was a corruption there. Now there was a three major culprits where the, the, the distilleries, alcohol manufacturing, sugar fa factories which manufacture sugar and the municipalities, the municipal corporation which are supposed to provide clean drinking water, they were polluting all into those rivers by putting all sorts of uh, untreated effluents in the river. So, these were the three. So, then I filed point number two, I told judges, please call all these Johnnies, you know, there was a liquor manufacturer, sugar manufacturer, I could get their names and they were called. And at the end of the day, I mean, they, they are all reported judgment, the court uh, uh, pass various orders that this has to change. Now, a stage came when court said that by this date, if you do not uh, put your uh, house in order, means you, you act according to the standards laid down by the uh, various laws, then you will stop your manufacturing. Justice Savant was the judge who did that. And then uh, they, they stopped and suddenly uh, some those who, 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 who were within the standard, they could continue the race were stopped. And su suddenly I found there was one Mohan Mikin distillery, a very rich man, very politically influential man. And of course, anyone who manufactures liquor is always rich because people <laughs> don't know yeah, how much to drink. So now th they, they, that chap suddenly after closing, after two months, he started functioning. So I said, how can he start functioning? There is no order of Supreme Court. Supreme Court has closed down and if you want to open, what he managed with the government of UP and the UP pollution control, but the standards were reduced to an extent that all pollutants can go on because it comes within the standard laid down by law. And the Supreme Court came down very heavily and they, they sent that um, managing director of that distillery to jail and they uh, passed orders against the pollution control board who did that. Now, this is how, therefore, you need no evidence, but you need an MI Cascure who will help you. Now, sometimes, now the bonded labor, a child is a bonded labor. I mean, it's unfortunate, a poor man may even sell the child for as low as uh, two dollars or five dollars equivalent in Indian rupees. And uh, uh, because that man has no right, uh, nothing to eat. And he said, okay, at least I'll get this much. And now that man is treated as a, as a I mean, this does happen all over India. So don't, don't think that this is something which is, but it does happen at some parts and some places. And then that man becomes a commodity of the person who has purchased. And he can do anything with that child. So there is bonded labor, there is uh, neglected children, exploitation of casual laborer, non-payment of wages, 
harassment and torture of persons. Then for women, there is a lot of problems of the women at the work, workplace. Uh, they, they, they are harassed, sexually harassed, etc. Now, how does all this, as I said, cannot be done by any individual. It cannot, therefore, the court says, okay, we take now about harassment to women at workplace. The Supreme Court passed a judgment that every employer who is em employing more than 50 employees will have a system where there will be a committee which will look into the complaints made. Normally, a woman will not like to make a complaint, at least more so in India, where you know you feel that it will uh, shame her or what will happen to her. Maybe she will not get a husband later on if, if, if this type of news goes out. All these restrictions are there. So, a committee in which there will be two ladies at least out of three will look into the problems. And if you do not form such a committee, then the a court will take action against you. So, now at all these bigger places and including government places, including Supreme Court, now there is this type of committees. So, any lady who has got this harassment can go there. And the court, of course, court made a completely a legislation, but the court has no power to make legislation. So, court said very well, we are making this as a guideline, which will be enforceable till parliament makes a law, you can replace this. And parliament has no time to do such good jobs. So, most of the time they are not. <laughs> <laughs> now, therefore, as I told you, there is sure moto action, uh, the, the, the court can. Then, for enforcement, the Supreme Court, even after passing the final judgment, it keeps the control because it knows that the moment the matter is disposed of, again, status quo ante will be uh, performed by a large number of actors, is my, is, if I may use that. So, they say very well, get me the report. All the matter is over. Normal course, if matter is over, the court can't do anything. But in PIL, court can do everything. So, they say, all right, Mr. So and so, you go and find out. Are, are our judgments being enforced? Somebody will monitor. And that again is, is very, very important jurisdiction which the Supreme Court uses and spends a lot of time. We have a green bench looking after environment which sits uh, on every Friday, three judges and the work is now so much so there are two green benches which sits on uh, every Friday. One is headed by the Chief Justice of India. Now, Supreme Court also in public interest appoints committees and commissions that you, so those who are expert in particular fields, they say you go there and come back and report to me what is happening. Is this, uh, is this going on, not going on? Now, there are two views whether the Supreme Court is exceeding its jurisdiction in doing all this. And, but a common man believes, sometimes the government also does not like this. Government believes that why are they harassing us? This is my jurisdiction. It's my right to take bribe. Supreme Court order prevents me from taking bribe and things like that. It's a bureaucrat does not like, government doesn't like. But the common man in, in the street says, we, I do not know whether Supreme Court has jurisdiction to do all this, but I am very happy that they are doing something. So, there is some control which is doing something good for a common man and that is how it goes on. Then environmental matter, they have done a lot. In fact, uh, our forest, all forests would have been cut, but for the Supreme Court intervention and then they pass some, some uh, orders which may look unreasonable. Nobody will cut trees at all without X, Y, Z. Nobody will do mining without X, Y, Z. So, sometimes it says the people who are complying with law, they also suffer. But in the larger interest, this has to be done and it is, it is done. Water pollution, as I told you, is a big problem, ecological problem. Now, what about criminalization, criminalization of politics? A Supreme Court judgment said that when anyone wants to file a nomination to contest election, either for parliament or for the state legislature, you must write down, is there any criminal case pending against you, were you ever uh, convicted of any criminal pro case, were you ever in jail. And Supreme Court said this is necessary so that a, a voter who wants to vote will know that, oh, this man has the three years he was in jail, so I will not vote for him. All politicians across all political parties were very angry with Supreme Court. They said, what business do you have to tell us? They say it is our business. We are the, we have jurisdiction to make laws. Who are you to make laws? Supreme Court said nothing doing. This will be enforced. Then Supreme Court said this will, this will be enforced till you make a law, and whatever law you want to make. When a law was made, Supreme Court said you have made a law, but this is a very unreasonable law. You have no business. <laughs> you have no business. <laughs> Why should a voter not have a choice to to elect a non-criminal as compared to a criminal? <laughs> Now, therefore, Supreme Court struck down that. Now, there is 
later on, this is a long time back, about 15. Now, today, the, what is current is that Supreme Court uh, gave a judgment that any sitting MLA or MP who is gone to jail for two years, is convicted for more than two years, his right to be member of parliament or member of legislature will disappear. He goes out. He is an MP till he goes to jail, then he ceases to be MP. And if you are, you have been convicted for two years, even if you have gone in appeal and your appeal is admitted, you will not function as a member of parliament. Again, all the politicians of all parties say this is a very terrible judgment. What type of judgment Supreme Court is giving? Why, why can't I have a right to commit crimes? What is all this <laughs> happening? <laughs> so, they came out with a law and there was a tremendous public opinion. The law is passed in the upper house of our parliament and there was such tremendous opposition to this and uh, so it was stuck in Lok Sabha. Then ruling party, because when parliament is not in session, can come out with an ordinance. So, they came out with an ordinance to nullify the Supreme Court judgment by saying that, well, if I am convicted for two years, so what? If my appeal is admitted, then, uh, then uh, I should be allowed to continue as member of parliament. So, ordinance is made when parliament is not in session. So, as long as parliament was in session, they tried their luck, they could not succeed. So, this ordinance came. When the ordinance came, ordinance, no law is valid till the president of the country signs it. So, ordinance was sent by the government to president of India, Mr. Pranab Mukherjee. Pranab Mukherjee called the ministers, two ministers, uh, 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 Mr. Kapil Sibal and Mr. Chidambaram. Um, um, fortunately, uh, Kamal Nath here. Yeah. Fortunately or unfortunately, both of them are Harvardians. So, they were called by president. He said, what, what are you doing? What type of uh, uh, um, uh, ordinance you are coming out? You are introduced in the parliament. You have not been able to pass. So, I want explanation. Because normally the president is supposed to sign when the cabinet, he has to act on aid and advice. But there are occasions when the president can also revolt and say, sorry, I will not sign this. And then uh, 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 our um, Mr. Rahul Gandhi, the vice president of Congress party, he said this is a nonsense uh, ordinance. It should be thrown in a waste paper basket. And suddenly all the politicians say, oh, yeah, yeah, you are right, you are right. We wrongly send the ordinance. So the ordinance has gone. Now, there are misuse of PIL. As I said, one hotelier against other hotelier or whatever uh, your enemy or your competitor or your some, some X to grind. So, the Supreme Court has laid down that yes, anyone can come and, and file a PIL, but uh, and I, I'll, I'll read from one of the judgment that uh, the ugly private interest, malice, wasted interest, and publicity seeking. Somebody is, somebody is interested in publicity. They, oh, I file such a PIL, so my name will come on the, all the channels of television and the newspaper, etc. So, publicity and private uh, interest litigation. That's I take bribe and file a petition of a public interest to, to harass somebody, etc. Et now, the court says that will not encourage this type of public interest litigation, and they have given two judgments. At the end of the day, let me tell you amongst the judges, there are judges who are pro public interest and there are judges who are anti who believe in that this is not my job status quo let the parliament do etc so it will all depend on in which before which court your matter goes but the judges who are overactive they manage to see that the matter comes before them because they, they will issue notice they once a notice is issued so by and large we are we are extremely happy and in fact i uh, uh, the in fact, I will invite uh, you are all uh, teachers or students to come to Supreme Court, be in New Delhi for about two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, whenever you have some holidays <coughs> here, and come and see in the theater of public interest litigation how things goes on and how it goes on. As I am also the president of Harvard Club of India, and I will be very happy to you know facilitate whatever I can do. And, uh, uh, I'm I'm very very happy, and in fact, I think uh, it will be good to have question answers now. Yes. So, yeah. Uh, I think that will be better. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Yeah. The, the correct because I mean I can go on and on, but I should not. <laughs> yeah. 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 They should be in parliament, it should not be disqualified. Uh, they can be in parliament, or if the appeal in the other court, uh, the judgment specifically says, uh, while taking the appeal, the court uh, specifically says that 
they can be in parliament, they will not be disqualified? Well, this is what politicians in India are talking, which is not correct. <laughs> what the correct facts are that after the judgment was passed, government filed a review petition. The review petition is filed when there is error appearance on the face of the record. When that review petition was filed, it was heard in the court. Court heard and court said that we have passed a judgment what we think is right. You always have a right to make legislation. That is their right. Of course, they have a right to make legislation. But even the new legislation can be challenged and court can say even this is bad. So, but politicians are twisting it to say what you say. You must have read in some newspaper many minutes to say that I did nothing. The Supreme Court told me come out with law. So, I have come out with ordinance. What is wrong? That's not correct. Supreme Court reiterated second time by dismissing review petition. But when you argue, the Supreme Court said, well, we don't think our judgment is wrong. We stand by our judgment. You want to make any law, you make. Now, that is interpreted to say, Supreme Court told me make law. Supreme Court never told them make law. I think in the judgment, isn't it written that if uh, the person who is uh, being convicted will be disqualified, but if the president no, president has no such power. It has to be done by the laws made by parliament. President signs it. But the, if they said if any law is made, then if, then my judgment can be overruled by the law if, if, they, if there's a valid law. And uh, such a law, Supreme Court will again strike down, take it from me. So this is this is not a valid law because it, I mean you you have a right to to see that good people become your representatives. In, in the parliament or the state legislature. Yeah. Uh, is there a limit imposed by funding or legislature on how many cases that the Supreme Court can take on its own initiative, like the postcard case? No, no, there is no, uh, no, there is no uh, limit. Sky, as I said, even sky is not the limit. <laughs> so that is, there, there is no, no limit. But uh, and they are taking a genuinely good cases and good causes, so so people are happy. I mean, nobody is. Uh, in fact, they give priority. All these cases they hear in the beginning, and other cases maybe even adjourn, but they will not adjourn these cases. Yeah. You know that law about um, people with criminal records cannot serve as MPs? Does that ever get misused? Like, do people initiate criminal proceedings just to retaliate uh, against other politicians so that they cannot? Yeah. Well, you are right. In fact, this is one of the defense which the politicians are taking, that my, my rivals, my pa opposite political party man will file cases against me. But this law does not say if a case is filed against you, you. it says if you are convicted and not a traffic offense of conviction of 100 rupees, but if you are convicted of sentence of two years or more, which will be a reasonably serious charge on a serious offense. So, Supreme Court does not say if someone files a case against you. Now, you will have to assume that if someone files a criminal case out of uh, vendetta, as you uh, said, then the court is likely to not frame charges. Court will say nonsense, there is nothing. I, I, I do not even start the proceedings. I will not charge it. I will not charge the accused. So, accused are out. Number two, assume the court wrongly says in an innocent man that, okay, I will entertain and I have charges framed. After that, there will be evidence you have to lead. So, man who says you have committed an offense will have to bring witnesses, documents, whatever it is, and other side will have a, accused as a choice to lead evidence or to keep mum. But even then, accused will be asked some questions by court to clarify his position if he wants to reply. He can say, I reply nothing. I am accused, so I, he has a right not to say anything. But court gives an option to him that this is what this man says, what do you have to say? If you want to say, say. If you do not want to say, because that you go by uh, evidence. Now, at the end of this, if the court comes to a conclusion and finds that the offense is uh, 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 major enough to send you to two years jail. Now, at that stage, if Supreme Court says that this is happening too, of, uh, too often, and in fact, I have written in my paper some large number of members of parliament and legislature, uh, states legislature, there are criminals, criminals who have been convicted. I, I can't call them a criminal uh, unless he's convicted. I'll call him an accused. So I'm not bothered. Judge is not, not saying that merely because you're an accused, uh, you will uh, not. But if you are convict, then you are a criminal. So, if you are a criminal, then the court has made this uh, provision to see that there is some, some little purity in your, because legislatures, if he is criminal and if he is going to take money and make law and vote for X or Y, is very dangerous for people, dangerous for democracy. What is, what is democracy? People you elect and they rule you. 
right? People who elect are criminals. What will they rule? They will misrule, not rule. So these are the, uh, I mean, I don't say there are not two views possible, but what you are saying is not merely because my enemy files a criminal case against me, I stop. No, the a court, court has to come to, and a criminal case is, as you know, the proof has to be beyond reasonable doubt. It can't be that if there are 50 50 chances, court will acquit you, it will not send you to jail. So there's no corruption of the criminal court, though? I'm, I'm talking about the pressure, you know, the court. Well, I tell you, I, I won't say there is no corruption. <laughs> And he's still the mayor? He's not, actually. They did it on purpose to put him out of power because okay. you know, they're saying he's still the criminal. He may not be the mayor, but he's just accused of things like corruption, which is yeah. the default sort of accusation, criminal accusation of Russia to put someone out of power. Let me tell you, I will not be able to say that there is no corruption in judiciary <laughs> in India. <laughs> but uh, the corruption amongst politicians is much, much more and much higher then in judiciary, and judiciary you have got a right to go to appeal, and the second appeal, High Court, Supreme Court, etc. So I, I won't say that there is no corruption. There is corruption perhaps everywhere, all over the world. And uh, but uh, uh, people have more faith in judiciary as compared to the to the bureaucrats and politicians. That's what I can say. I can't say there is no corruption. I mean, but then if the corrupt judgment has come, then the higher court is likely to correct it. But by uh, the fear of that, if you say, no, no, all this uh, bunch of criminals should rule us, then uh, you have a choice to uh, do this or that, you know. And court has opted for the other one. Yeah, you are saying, yeah. And can you talk a little bit about um, how you overcome this, the challenges you get when, you're, when you issue a judgment that has fierce opposition in local, in local counties, and, and you said um, sometimes you can throw the person in jail and you can use your power and you know, arrest these people, but then what about when there's a system of people or a network of companies who are sort of perpetrating a larger scheme against, you know, like children or women or, and how, how, do, you, how do you go about doing that when they're sort of protected by either support or by money? Well, I tell you, there is no doubt that in all jurisdictions in the world, moneyed people have an advantage as compared to those who don't have money, and that's true in all jurisdictions. A moneyed people will engage the top lawyer in that subject. He will spend a lot of money. A poor man cannot engage. So when you have a very top lawyer and a very uh, mediocre or uh, below mediocre, then uh, that man knows what to argue, that man knows what to plead. But this is a reality worldwide and you cannot uh, overcome it. But that's why when the Supreme Court takes over as a public interest litigation, then this does not matter. He will say, oh yes, Mr. So, you are a very top lawyer. but why don't you understand this? Why don't you agree with me? So at, at times, at least out of courtesy for the yes, 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 my lord, your lordship is right. That's how. It, so that, but money plays an important role in everything in life in every country. So you, I, I won't say that uh, the rich and poor have the equal battlefield in the courts. No, no courts in no country. Yeah. Uh, so the efforts of the Indian Supreme Court are definitely laudable, but one of the greatest criticisms levied against public interest litigation is that they are usurping the power of the parliament, which is to make laws, and um, can, in some cases like Vishaka versus State of Rajasthan, which you mentioned, yeah. um, there was in fact an implementation of CEDAW, which should have been done first by the parliament, and these were just the temporary guidelines that were made. So. And now there is still no law. But um, the parliament really consists of people who were uh, elected by the people and they are the voice of the people. But the judges are not really the voice of the people. So can, can in the light of this, is uh, the public interest... Let me say, you are right and wrong. <laughs> <laughs> there are two views. The reason why I tell you you are right and wrong is that there are two views. One view would say that uh, the job of courts is to adjudicate and nothing more, nothing less. Job of members of parliament is to make laws. Now, a stage comes in life of any country where 
people find that well uh, this chap has no power as I told you a common man does no constitution does no law. he said I do not know whether this uh, judges have power, but they are doing a good job let them carry on. That public opinion matters and it is because of public opinion that the, the parliament is unable to override the supreme court judgments. There are two fears one is the public opinion that such a wonderful judgment what is this uh, crooks doing by making a law to override it number one. Number two they will say that you make such a law again supreme court will strike it down and say sorry your, your amendment makes no difference you are still the, the vice is there and that is why supreme court has expanded the scope of fundamental rights. Article 14, article 19, article 21 which says personal life and liberty they say what is a life unless it is not an animal life. So, in life I will read into you must give them a free education and there was so much of pressure due to that supreme court judgment they had to amend constitution by adding article 21 a saying that yes of course life does not mean uh, animal life. Therefore, courts have gone beyond there is no doubt, but then uh, a, a, the public opinion says they are doing a good job let them do whether jurisdiction no jurisdiction then that is why I said you are right and wrong both, but I think uh, uh, you you must go by public opinion in democracy and that is how it is going on that is why they, they are carrying on sometimes they exceed also I do not say that they are always right, but by and large they are right. Yeah. By and large the court gives the message to the government to carry these education. Likewise, uh, just like the Shaka's case where DK Basu said the guidelines, <laughs> guidelines on the law press. Now, there is a very interesting situation here in Australia. At the moment, she has no law which prohibits surrogacy. We have no law which allows surrogacy. We have had three bills, the previous two bills lapsed in uh, the last successive years. And now what is happening is, we have one very interesting case, the case of Jan Balas. It is a case of a German national. And Germany does not allow surrogacy. It's a complete no, no. So this child was about three years old and this couple had been running around frantically. And ultimately this case leaves the photos of the Supreme Court of Canada and it was before a very uh, knowledgeable judge. So what he did was, he was waiting to frame guidelines. He as a one-time exception directed the Union of India and the Central Adoption Resource Agency, which is the nodal agency uh, for uh, inter-country adoptions, which was again conceived out of as a public interest litigation petition way back in 1987, it has been rooted, but funded for the Union of India. So you know, the judges also twist the government saying, look here, the man writing on the wall, wall is loud and clear, please act. So this case is still pending for final adjudication and regrettably you have no legislation, no guidelines so far. Yeah. Yes, please. I am Parth Sarthi, I am a real candidate here. And my question is slightly different from the topic which you speak, but uh, yeah, because yeah. the discussion was happening on conviction, I want you to know, uh, since you have the distinguished expertise as a litigator in Supreme Court, is the judiciary really serious about overcoming the challenge of delaying uh, justice decision making process? Because I'm asking this question that we had this conviction of Lalit yeah. Seventeen years out of that, for ten years, he was almost the chief priest and yeah. remaining yeah. 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 And this is so disturbing that a criminal was yeah. formulating, I mean, supposedly formulating laws for us. Every time a new chief justice comes, he says that they are going to do something about judiciary. The law minister also says the same. I'm not on the part of parliament side. We know that our parliament is completely a party. But is judiciary <laughs> going to do something about that because you have been, uh, I mean, uh, associated with the Supreme Court for such a long time? Are there serious about it? I'll tell you. The problem is number. The number of uh, human beings, and if you uh, look at the ratio between the litigation, there is the number of cases and the judges is a very, very uh, poorly, poor ratio. Large number of cases are filed. The Today, most of the courts are able to now control in the sense if there are 100 cases filed, they are disposed of 100 or 102. But the areas is such huge areas and on that again, the, the, the court uh, government is also not very, very uh, cooperative in giving more finance, having more court rooms, having more things. So, it is, uh, it is true that justice delayed is justice denied and uh, uh, under the within the framework and under the circumstances by and large uh, at least more than 80 percent of judges do their best to dispose of. I, uh, there are some lazy judges also, but uh, I will I will say that almost more than 80 percent do a good job under the circumstances because uh, it is not as if they, have, uh, they can just say okay I dispose of dismiss, 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 that is also no good. 
So they, they, they I mean, it, it's, it's a serious problem. There is no doubt. But, but. So I understand that. What I'm trying to understand is the kind of judicial activism we have. Is it not possible that judicial activism is extended to the extent that Supreme Court orders that? Let's say we have this in Indian judicial service, which is like hanging since the last 20 years. We have more number of courts, we have more number of judges. Is it not, I mean, through a public interest litigation or, I mean, Supreme Court do, does get an opportunity? Can, can they not do there is, know that parliament is not There ready? is a public interest litigation called All India Judges Case, and in which the Supreme Court keeps on guarding the government, keeps on passing orders, certain little uh, benefit is done by that judgment, but it's not possible for them to say now you'll build so many court buildings and uh, you'll appoint so many judges and at higher level even getting good judges, most of the top lawyers refuse to become judges because uh, they, they earn so much. And there was a time, good old days, in, I became a lawyer in 1965, when if a chief justice called you Mr. So and so, you become a judge, it was a call of duty, you could never say. Now today the lawyers say sorry. I'm earning so much, I don't want to become a judge. And if you invite lawyers who are earning nothing, then they will be a disaster, by and large. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes? So, uh, one of the things that I see is that if judges, I, I think a fear that liberals have, is if judges are, you know, very liberal and fight for the public interest and act as public advocates for the people. What if one day those judges change and they're not as liberal and they don't want to protect <coughs> and expand the fundamental rights? So how, how, what's the protection there for a court that might not be as friendly to the public and that might not have the common person in mind? Yeah. You, know, you know what is an intoxicant? <laughs> Alcohol intoxicates you. <laughs> But this power of judiciary also intoxicates them. So by and large, they say, yes, uh, my name comes on the front page of newspaper. I am there on TV 24 hours, and my name says, yes, I did this wonderful job against criminals. So don't worry, judges will continue to do this job. There is a <laughs> Uh, yes. Is, uh, is there any kind of uh, social problem that you would say is not receiving enough uh, attention in PIL right now? No, I won't say it's not receiving, but uh, uh, you see, the PIL is unable to solve all problems. And as I said, there are some judges who are uh, conservative, if you call them, and they say, well, this is not my, not my business, let me not do it. So it will all depend on. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, Supreme Court can't solve all problems. In fact, nobody can solve all problems. Parliament can't solve all problems. Supreme Court can't solve. There are a lot of uh, problems. We have a huge population. Our, uh, uh, economically, we are improving, but uh, to feed that huge population, uh, they, 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 there are problems. And I mean, I won't say all problems can be sorted out by judiciary. But it can't be sorted out by anybody, but people are trying. Yes. So I have a follow-up question to the um, question that was asked previously about um, So you said that there were no court fees in front of this litigation. Is it the case that government leaders are assigned to both parties you, in the You see, I'll tell you. The court fee in a writ petition is very nominal. In a, in a civil suit, there is a court fee. Criminal cases, there are no court fee. In a writ petition, it's a token court fee you have to pay. But if the court takes up on their own, then no court fee is payable. So when Chief Justice Misra told me that Mr. Parekh, you file a writ petition. On that writ petition, no court fee I paid because it is not payable because the court says I am taking suo moto action. So in a court fee in a writ petition is not as, these are all writ jurisdiction by Supreme Court under Article 32 or High Courts under Article 226. So the a court fee is not a serious problem and court will, on the contrary, will tell the those uh, criminals or polluters or that you, you better bring so much of money. In fact, in recently all mining operation in certain areas were closed down because they were illegally mining, affecting environment. So Jazzy said all that you have mined, I will direct government to sell it by auction, get the maximum price and that price will not go to you, you are the owner of the ore which you have mined. And I will use that to now make amends to the violation of pollution you have done. So that huge money, court can always order and get the money and use it for the right purpose. Okay, I guess the question was more in terms of who is representing the person who filed. So, uh, you know, 
if part of the point is of the public interest litigation is to protect the interests of the public who can't represent themselves and hire their own lawyers, yeah. so then the person who files that PIL, uh, do they have to be, say, a moneyed person who can afford... No, no, as I told you... And then what happens to the no, no. That, this this uh, PIL is filed under the writ jurisdiction, and the writ jurisdiction, the court fee payable is uh, hundred rupees and things like that. So there is no court, and court can exempt you. The court has power to say even don't pay hundred rupees. You are doing such a wonderful job. On the contrary, will they will ask the opposite side? You better finance the cost of this investigation, cost of this monitoring. You chef space. So they, in a PIL, there is no money. Nobody has stopped going to court by because of the constraint of money. It's a, just a token money which court will always weigh with. There's a good cause raised by you. Court will not ask you to pay. On I think maybe what she was asking is, I, I take it the the big cost of litigation is the lawyer's fee. So when the court appoints you, you are free. Free, right? Free. You, uh, yes. So that's the first point. Uh, and I suppose one little question is, do you have any choice about that? I mean, can you refuse if they, are, if they appoint you? And then the second part is, what if some of the defendants in the PIL are not rich companies or polluters or the government, but are also people who might not be able to afford a lawyer? Would the court appoint a lawyer for them as well? Have I got your question? Okay, as far as the MITS Curie appointed by the court is concerned, uh, most of the top lawyers don't take. There is some, some token uh, money payable to you if you are acting as amicus curiae. There is a table of money which is paid to you. But most of the lawyers just refuse to accept that token money which comes from the court funds. But as, as he says, I have never seen any, any lawyer refusing to honor the court's request because it is a great honor for a lawyer that the court has found him fit enough to assist the court. And number two, lawyers also want to practice in the same court. And in the tea club of judges, the word will go, oh, Parek, I asked him to appear. And he said, no. He said, oh, my God, Parek, tomorrow his case I will dismiss. May not say so. <laughs> <laughs> so Parek is afraid that how dare I say no to Emma Kaskuri. Other questions? Yeah. 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 questions, comments? Uh, it is a fascinating area. I think India's pretty unique in the world. I mean, I, I'm no expert on this, but as far as I know, no jurisdiction goes as far as India does allowing both the court to initiate litigation or someone with a postcard or the way in which you <laughs> describe. And, I, and that is an interesting question. I think your question about what we would think about this in the American context, there's often been, as some of you know, I don't know if first year students, you know, you study a little bit about standing and, you know, there was the question of whether or not, you know, environmental groups could bring standing just on their own or that there have to be some case or controversy or specific injury. But it's a, it's a functioning system that I think uh, is doing many things. Now, many of you are knowledgeable and brought really terrific questions. I guess the last thing, if you have two minutes to yeah, yeah. address, is there's, there's a really complex relationship between the court system and the legislature here. And in India, uh, I've spent enough time there, and I say with the greatest love of the country possible, each of those systems has their own issues. You know? I mean, the, the, the court system, I think you were pointing out the kind of massive delays in the court system that go for ordinary litigation and the kind of paralysis that we've now seen in the political process of getting anything through the Lok Sabha and the government, not, not as bad as ours. I mean, at least your government's open, but, uh, you know. So I guess I wonder how you think about these two things working together, right? That is, the, is, is in some sense, does the public interest litigation take some of the pressure off fixing some of the dysfunction of the legislature? Does it play off some of the dysfunction of the legislature? And partly, as you said, because we know, we'll tell them they can pass a law, but we know they'll never get around to doing it. Uh, how do you see the relationship between the legislature and the public interest litigation in kind of this current moment in India? The legislators, by and large, hate courts for doing any public interest litigation. And I use the word hate, you know, not dislike, they hate. But 
they are also worried that if they openly criticize the judiciary, they may not get votes and their opponents will say, look, this chap is talking against Supreme Court in public interest litigation, do not vote for him. So, he is also afraid in publicly criticizing the courts. It, it, it happens up to a point, but they hate in their bottom of their heart, they hate judiciary for doing what they think is their exclusive monopoly and why are they interfering. We are not interfering in their judicial work, why are they interfering, that it is there, but, but it's, it is now too, too much uh, in the mind and hearts of an Indian citizen that he wants judiciary to carry on and any, any politician who will oppose, he, he may get lesser votes if not get defeated in the election. Well, I certainly know that anyone who opposes you will be in trouble because that was really an incredibly effective and persuasive explanation of a very good subject. Thank you. Very much. Beat the distinguished advocate or our other distinguished yes, guests. Yes, yes. By the way, thank you so much for, for coming. Really appreciate it.